To me, my Bible is my American Express. I need never leave home without it. I got one in my car, got one in my truck. You never know when you're going to need it and talk to somebody about the Lord. And, and um, <coughs> But anyway, last week we talked about um, Israel um, is God's uh, uh, chosen people. And, uh, oh, we all swallowed. We need to talk about a whole lot of here. Yeah. Um, Israel and the Gentiles, how the Gentiles are engraved uh, into God's tree, uh, and Israel being the branches, and um, and and so um, we we uh, um, last week talked about the mercy of God for Israel and the mercy of God for the for the Gentiles, and so and God's. God's uh, purpose in allowing the blindness in part to come came upon Israel so that the fullness of the Gentiles can come in. All right, and we were talking last week to those who weren't here, uh, Romans 11, 25 through 20, 36. And it ended, because remember chapters 9 through 11 deals mainly with um, the Israel um, and talking to the Jewish people that were in Rome. And so, uh, but God's uh, purpose in allowing blindness in part come upon Israel so that the fullness of the Gentiles can come in. By the Gentile, or by Israel, um, turning a blind eye to the Messiah, to Christ, right, then um, the Gentiles came in. And so it was opened the door for us. And thank God it did. And it was all in God's planning. In part was the idea of temporary blindness, because one day what's going to happen in the in the end times that Israel, the 144,000, the two Jewish uh, witnesses, you know, and they're going to be penetrating Israel, and, and, and Israel is going to be saved as a whole. And I talk about individually, all right, because there's some that won't, just like us, you know. There's some that are saved, and there's some not, and so, um, but some are still going to reject. But as a whole. Israel will be saved, not like it is today. Um, and then we talked about um, one, um, and it says, This is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. We use Isaiah 27 9, by this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob, talking about Israel, be purged, all right, being flushed out. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin, when he maketh all the stones of the altar of chalk stone. And our beaten is under the grooves, and images shall not stand up. Um, what separates fallen man from a holy God? Sin. Sin. Salvation is the forgiveness and the removal of sin. God's uh, Son paid the price on the cross, paid the debt for both Jew and Gentile. Right, he, he died on the cross for all. And God's mercy is upon his chosen people, and one day, by the grace and sovereign will, Israel will be saved. And then we talk about the mercy of the, uh, God for the Gentile. Uh, whether the Gentile or Jew, our salvation is not based on mercy, but it's based, uh, excuse me, it's based on mercy and not merit. All right, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter what you what, what you do and everything, it's by God's mercy that we are saved. It's by God's mercy and by His grace that we are saved. Psalms 86, 4 and 5. Rejoice the soul of thy servant for unto thee. O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. John MacArthur pointed out, um, we talked about last week, uh, man's sin manifested in his willful Disobedience proves a means for God to demonstrate the magnitude and the graciousness of His mercy. Right. Of His mercy. And um, so we are all part of God's tree, even though we are grafted in. We are just like Ruth. We are grafted in to, to uh, God's tree. And it is just so awesome. Then we talked about the last one we had last week is the mercy of God is in the depth of His love for us. 
And so and it says here, all the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And this is going from verse 33 through 36. Can we really understand God? And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even also I am known. And so we die, and we go to heaven, we will fully you know, understand and we'll know. And will we know everything that God knows? No. We're not God. But we will know things that we don't know down here. You know. And boy, I can't wait. The first one I want to see is my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, we sit around talking with the apostles, huh? Wouldn't that be great? Jacob and all of them. Uh, Charles Spurgeon will be there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be a good sit around and talk, talk. No. They don't have Sky Angel up there, by the way. I'm curious. Do you think they all want to talk to you? Well, yes, they will. <laughs> I hope so. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, and who hath been his counselor? Um, and we talked about Job, you know, and Job's um, bickering and stuff like that. And God said, well, who, you know, you know, formed everything, and who did all this? Were you there, Job? Were you there? You know, did you put the bells on Orion? Did you, you know, did, were you there? And uh, and so we don't understand or know all of what God knows because we are finite, but God is infinite. Um, but His love is pure for us. And, and in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated His own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. Yes. While we were yet sinners, when we were unperfect, yes. you know, nothing that we can do, you know, it's, it's, it's all Him. Yes. It's all Him. Yes. And, uh, but then, you know, God is the source, the sustainer, and the rightful end of everything that exists, to whom be the glory forever. And that's where we closed last week. Now we're going to pick up here today. Let's take a look at chapter 12. It says, and we're going to do two verses, and these two verses are so powerful, so full uh, of Christian living and what we are to do as Christians. Just these two verses. These two verses. Now listen here. And look what he says here. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Yes. Oh, I love these two verses. Yes. And so what is it, what, it, what what's today's missing word? What is missing in today's <laughs> culture? You all know. You deal with it with your families. You deal with it um, at work. No, what is missing in today's culture? Commitment. Commitment. Commitment in marriages. Marriages don't last long today. Somebody gets mad at the wife because she doesn't cook right. You're out the door, sweet cheeks. You need to wait on me. You need to serve me. You need to do what I want to do. Or they have disagreements. Instead of talking about the disagreements and the stuff, what do they do? They separate. They get divorced. Because they had an argument. How many of us all had arguments? My wife and I always had, you know, always, you know, my wife and I get into these little disputes. No. The coach says, you guys are arguing. I said, no, we're not. We're just discussing loudly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and, 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 and commitment in families. You know, with, with, with um, parents nowadays, these young folks, they're not committed to their children. Who's raising the children? <laughs> Grandparents. Grandparents are, parents are too busy doing this and that and everything else. And it's, now it's the grandparents' responsibility to raise up their children, to teach them right from wrong, to get them, you know, to use the toilet, to, to do other things. It's the grandparents that are doing it because parents are not committed in doing these things. 
And this is what, you know, and there's also, um, um, we have a um, 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 lack of commitment um, in the church. We have a lack of commitment in the church. People just come on Sunday. What about Thursday Bible study? What about you know all these things? To come as a family of God and dig into God's Word and discuss God's Word together. We talk about everything else under the sun, right? Why can't we talk about God's Word together? It's commitment. We're not committed. We start something, then we move. We're not committed to see it through. And in today's society, even at the workplace, Kids don't want to work today. These young folk, they're too busy on their cell phone. They're too busy texting their girlfriend to do any kind of work. You know what the coolest of his job he wanted to have? He wanted to be a YouTuber. I said, Dakota, there's no money in YouTube. Where are you going to get money? Well, you get so many followers and stuff like that. But, you know, but there's, there's no commitment. Young folks don't want to get a job. I don't want to work at Burger King. <laughs> I love to work at Burger King. Look at all the hamburgers and french fries. <laughs> Man, all that good stuff. You know what I'm saying? Free lunch? I don't know if they gave me free anymore. But, you know, when I worked at Walmart. I worked right, and remember they used to have McDonald's in Walmart? And I worked in the deli. And every time for my lunch, I always went over to it, and I said, give me a number one supersize, please. <laughs> love my number one supersize. How many know what number one supersize is? Big Mac and Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, you get a number one supersize, too, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Love that number one supersize. But the commitment folks, ha a kids have today, you know, they don't want to commit to jobs. They don't want to commit to family. They don't want to commit to nothing, but they all think of what? Themselves. The world owes me everything. My stepfather told me years ago that the world doesn't owe you nothing and it's going to chew you up and spit you out. And believe me, I've got spit out many times, you know. And so, but the commitment, and, and, and there's a lack of commitment in evangelism. You know, believers aren't sharing their faith with the outside world. They're not telling people about Jesus. You know, telling people about what Jesus has done for them in their life. There's a, there's a lack of commitment in evangelism. And so, when we see all of this, you know, Paul calls us to what? Here in chapter 12, these two verses, Paul calls us to what? To surrender all to him. Our bodies, our minds, and our wills to him. To surrender him. And there is a difference between belief and belief. I mean, I can say, man, I believe there's a hurricane coming. There's a hurricane coming. But then I just sit and do nothing. Where's my belief? Now, if there was a hurricane coming, let me tell you, I'll be packing my stuff, and I'll be getting out of Dodge. One time, how many remember the tornado that touched down in the airport? Remember that? I, well, I was working at McDonald's, or Walmart at the time, and I just had my lunch, and I sat down, and I was ready to eat, and they said, everybody in the middle of Walmart, in the center of Walmart, I sat there. My boss came in and chewed me out because I did not move. And I said, you listen here. I said, standing in the middle of Walmart is not going to protect us. Well, let me tell you one thing. I just sat down for my lunch. And if I'm going to go see my Lord and my Savior, I'm going on a full stomach. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Eat first. Yeah. I was going on a full stomach. I'm hungry. <laughs> Tired. Oh, worn out. But anyway, he asks us to uh, call to surrender our bodies. Take a look here. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable 
service. Let us break that down. I beseech you. It's a passion call of Paul to the church. It is a passion call. I beseech you. The word is parakleo. Parakleo. And it means to call to one side. Call, summon, to beg. To beg. To me, I call it a pastor's call to the church. Pastor's call to the church. To begging them. A beg. I beg you, please. Please, I beg you. The reason for Paul's compassionate call, and therefore refers to that, uh, precedes it. Therefore, this call is to believers, brethren. He calls them brethren, believers, right? To the church itself. It is by the mercies of God, love, grace, and salvation. You know, it's by God's mercies. It's by the mercies of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, by God's mercy, because of His love, His grace, and the salvation that is given. He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Ooh, what does that mean? How can you be a sacrifice and still be living? I mean, when you get a sacrifice, I mean, here Abraham was taking Isaac up in the, up, up the mountain there, and, you know, Isaac is looking around and stuff, carrying the wood, and he says, hey, hey, pops, you know, we got the wood and everything, and you know, we got the fire. Where's the sacrifice? What did Abraham say? God will provide a sacrifice. And God will provide. John MacArthur says, it is uh, because our bodies are yet unredeemed that, that they must be yielded continually to the Lord. Our bodies are unredeemed. Now our soul, we come to know Christ. Christ lives in us. We have the Holy Spirit. You know, but our bodies, our bodies are rough. Our bodies war against the Spirit. And, um, and the flesh and the spirit, they war against one another, just like in Galatians 5, um, um, 16 and 17. You know, where it says that the, our, our spirits war against the flesh. They, 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 they aren't, you know, they don't, uh, they're like uh, oil and water. They don't mix. And they tug a war on one another. They pull on one another. And this is where I'm going to ask Ian, and Peyton and Mally. Where's Mal? I did this a long time ago. He's not here. Mally's here. He's in the... Mally um, is not here at all. There is Now, Mally, you sit there. Now, you wait, wait a minute, Peyton. You sit there, man. Like, sit down there, old buddy. Okay, now, we have here, I hate to say this, sorry, Mally, the devil. <laughs> <laughs> here we have the flesh. Okay? And, and this is us. Okay? Before we are saved, all right, our flesh is being driven around by the, by the devil. All right? Right? Our flesh is being driven around yes. by the devil. All right? And when whatever the devil wants and whatever the devil does, you know, and so because of our sinful nature. All right? But then when we get saved, okay, excuse me, Mally, can you get up now? Go, go, go have a seat right over here. Have a seat right there. All right. Peyton, come on up. Have a seat. There is the Holy Spirit. All right, Peyton, you're the Holy Spirit. All right. You're still the flesh. But now, the, 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 the Holy Spirit is driving the flesh. All right? <laughs> All right? And so we are we are led by the Spirit, but then a lot of times when the flesh gets antsy and everything and starts to bat on them, <laughs> and, 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 and it ends up the flesh wants to take over. Let's switch seats. The flesh gets to the driver's seat, and the Holy Spirit takes the back seat. 
and, and we're driven by our flesh. Okay? And, and so, you see the war that's happening here? And then, then the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. <laughs> and then he gets back over here. And the Holy Spirit is driving you guys. You see what I'm saying? And then, he, then, then the flesh is saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? He's pretty good at that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's give him a hand. The battle that is happening in, you know, in us because of the war that is happening in us. Until we are completely glorified, we're going to have that battle. But the, what, whatever you feed the most okay, is going to be the strongest. Do you understand? You know, how do you feed your spirit? But by reading God's word and, try, and, and obeying God's word and living for him. And not for yourselves or anything else, okay? It's, it's him. So, um, so we have that war. Now the sacrifices years back required by law are no longer of any effect. No more killing of animals. No more the, the slaughtering of the, 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 the unblemished lambs and stuff. Why? Because Christ did it all on the cross for us. He did it all for us. And so when Christ appears as high priest of the good things to come, he is entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands or not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all who obtained eternal Redemption. Eternal redemption. That is out of um, Hebrews 9, 11, and 12. He is our high priest. Yes. He has entered into the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle that is made without hand. Yes. You know, and he sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us. Yes, because Satan is going to attack. Satan is going to try to knock you down. Satan is going to try to do things that you don't want to do. Remember what Paul says. I do the things I don't want to do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. You know, so he, 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 he has that struggle because of the flesh and that war against. And now the redeemed of Christ are to offer themselves all that they are and have as living sacrifices to God. The only acceptable worship now under the new covenant is offering ourselves to God. Offering everything that we are, everything that we have, to Him. That is the living sacrifice. What says giving your bodies, all right, as a living sacrifice. <coughs> is I, and the, the greatest song, you know, the greatest song that goes with that is I surrender all. All. Because your soul's already His. Yeah. We gotta surrender our mind and our bodies and our wills to Christ. And our wills to Christ. Many today, like in Malachi's day, not my grandson. Malachi's day gave God second best. Gave God just second best. It's like when we give for the food pantries or something like that. We don't give what we really like. We give what we, somebody gave us and we don't like. <laughs> don't we? Be honest. You look through your cupboard and say, well, this has been here for a while. <coughs> and we only give, you know, and so, and it's... It, it, like they're talking today in Sunday school, I and mean, there's a big round circle. We, we do the exact same things that they did back then. You know, they follow God, they didn't follow God. They follow God, they didn't follow God. They follow God, they, just like in, in Judges, the, the big circle. They kept them going around in the circle, you know. You know, they're in sin. God raised up a, a, 
uh, a judge to lead them and everything, and then all of a sudden they were led to prosperity and everything, and then the judge dies. And then they're like, well, we do now. And they go right back into their sin. And then God raises up another judge, and then they prosper, and then the judge dies. <laughs> and, you know, so, and it, it's round round, just like we, I said in our Bible study, or Sunday school, 9 11 hit. How great our America came together. How many came to church because of 9 11? A few months after, a few, few months out, what happened then? People pitted up. They stopped going to church. They stopped doing what they're doing. You know, the fear was over, yeah. and they went right back to their lifestyle. And because you know we are habitual people, and we we do things that we, we like to do. And in Malachi one six to eight says, "A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. Wow. Wow. If then this is the Lord speaking, if then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests." that despise my name, and ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon my altar, and ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In thee say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? Would you give that life for the president? You'd be embarrassed to give that to someone like that. But God is real, and he, is, and he needs our surrendering to him. Malachi 3.18 says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In time and honor. Give it on. We are to give God our best. When we get paid, we give top right off the top. We give him our best. We don't give him the little oh, well, let's see what they got in my wall. I know I got 50 cents. Oh, there we go. But you got millions in the bank. But you only give God 50 cents. And so we, we are to give God our best. And, and what did um, uh, Paul say uh, in um, 2 Corinthians? We are to be a cheerful giver, right? Yeah. Giving God our first fruits, our very best. 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 6 and 7, Paul says, But this I say, which he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he shall soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Right. Not an Archie Bunker. Not one that puts in a 50 and draws out a 49 out of the offering plate. Make the change. We are to give God our best. And what does he mean by your reasonable service? Reasonable law hipkos. Term from which we get logic or logical. Mr. Spock from Star Trek says what? It is not logical. Yeah. It, that's where we get the word from logic, logitko. Only um, our only reasonable or logical and by implicational spiritual service of worship is to present God with all that we are and all that we have. It's God's anyways, isn't it? Yeah. Why not give it to him? You'll give back much more. Give it to him in faith, knowing that he will take care of it and use it for his glory. So we are called uh, call, uh, to give our bodies as living sacrifices to God, to give our bodies a call to surrender 
your mind. Surrender our bodies and now surrender your mind. And a lot of times our minds, you know, our mind is where the battle of sin is, is won or lost, is in your mind. To do it or not to do it. Like the old thing, the little devil on your shoulder, the little angel on your shoulder. The battle of the mind is first law, or the battle is first law. The battle of sin is first law in the mind. To do it or not. <coughs> And so, it says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing. Uh, so much competition today for our minds, isn't it? So much. Television is a big one, right? What is on TV? What is, what is good for our children? What is not good for our children? What is good for us? What is not good for us? So much violence on TV. That really, for you know... I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're starting to get a little bit more medical shows about it, like 911 and, and some other ones that are coming out. But again, they always put that junk in there, you know, in today's program. Well, even back in the old days, they did that too. Um, because they, 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 I don't know what Hollywood does, but you know, whoever's producing and does that kind of thing, they put their own thoughts and their own agenda into things to promote it. You never thought about homosexuality and stuff like that, but look at Three's Company. That was a good foot in the door. You know, we laughed about it. We joked about it. You know, he pretending to be a homosexual because he's living with two, two, two girls. And we laughed about it. We joked about it. But look at what it opened the door for in society. And see, see, and so the battle of our of our um, our minds. You know. We have so much um, competition for our minds, so much to read too, books, peri periodicals, magazines, and all that kind of stuff. Some are good, educational, uh, things to know, but other things are bad, not good. Books that have a lot of cursing, the dumb, no good, you know, and, and books that you know, promote sex and all this and that, no good, but it's in our minds. You know? And, and, and our bodies and our sinful nature cry, uh, uh, crave for these things. Uh, and so much on videos and, and TV. I mean, um, computers, a big one now, the internet. You don't know what to believe or not to believe on there. Facebook, you know, they put all this news and stuff on there, but you don't know if they, if they uh, rigged it up to say what they wanted to say. You know? And, and so... So much that in, the, in today's society, in our culture, affects our minds. Pardon? Fake news. Fake news. Right. Fake news. John MacArthur points out this: that it is the it is the mind that our new nature and our old humanness are intermixed. It is in the mind that we make choices as to whether we will express our new nature in holiness or allow our flesh, humanness, to act in unholiness. Oh, how true a statement that is. Remember I said, the battle of sin is first won. First, or won or lost in the mind first. In the mind first. Um, and it says, um, be conformed. It says, be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the ruling of your mind. Be conformed. Susakeya Mata I don't know if I pronounced that right. But it is to conform oneself, one's mind and character to another's pattern. Basically, it means masquerading or putting on an act when we conform to this world. Because we're not of this world. Christians are not of this world. We need to show, we need to shine it, we need to live it. Not hide it because some of our friends are going to mock us and, and ridicule us. So what? I always tell my kids too, you know, in, in school and stuff, I mean, they get in arguments and stuff, I mean, why please them? When you, when you get out of high school and stuff, they're going to be gone one way and you're going to be gone another way. 
Why please with their, make them happy? The way you dress or the way you act, the way you do things. Be yourself. Be yourself. But so many people don't want to be, they want to be somebody else. They want to be uh, another, you know, person, like a superhero or something. You know how kids do it when they're little? They want to be like Superman. I remember one time I found out that I could not fly. I don't know if I was chubby or just uh, the weight of myself or what, but I had my, my Superman costume, you know, when I was a kid for Halloween. I got up on this big old chair and I jumped off. Huh? When I jumped off the chair, you were at work. And uh, I jumped off the chair like a fly, and I laid there for a while, and that went right on. And uh, but we try to, con we you know, we conform to others and what others like us to be and what others think us to be. We need to want to think what God wants us to be. God has a plan for each and every one of our lives, and He has a plan for us. And Paul is telling the Roman church, we are not to masquerade as worldly persons for whatever reason. We are not to masquerade around. J.B. Phillips translates this phrase as, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. We must not become victims of the world, and you know who is the prince of this world. Satan. Satan is the prince of this world. And we are not to be molded or constricted you know, into the, that path. We are to be our, uh, what God wants us to be. We are to be, re we, how do we renew our minds? How do we renew our minds? Because we are habitual people. And you need to get in the habit of doing these things. You need to get in the habit and change your whole pattern. Because you can get up in the morning and know exactly what you're going to do without even being awake. I mean, how many of you know, do things before you get your first cup of coffee in the morning? You know? I mean, the first thing I, you know, we like to do is get up and go right to the coffee pot. This is how we are, you know, going to that coffee pot. <laughs> Getting it all set up and everything, and then you got to let it perk and everything else. Then I go back and lay down and say, until the perking is done, and I go back out there to get my cup of coffee. You know, but we, we're in a habit of these things that we do. Some people get up in the morning, the first thing they want to do is get that sleepy breath off your mouth. You know, that cotton mouth. They go brush their teeth or whatever, just in case they might have company or over for early or something. They might pop in. You don't want to knock them out. <laughs> you open the door, hello! <laughs> Where'd you come from, the grave? <laughs> What was that? Sound like me, you got too much time when you hang. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you get up in the morning and you, you want to brush your teeth. But we have these certain rituals you do every morning. You can do it without even knowing you're doing it. Yeah. Now how many times you go and do something, you did it, but then you think, did I do that? Yeah. Did I do that? You have to go back and double check. You did it, but you did it subconsciously because you just normally do it. Or how many times you're, you're driving on vacation and everything, you're going past where you normally turn off to go to work. And you're thinking of something else and whatever. And there you go. Like you're going to work. Because it's a habit of the way you're driving. Yeah. We're habitual people. And so we've got to transform. How do we renew our minds? By turning out negative information. Tuning it out. Tuning out the negative and by spending time being quiet before God. Spending time in God's Word, reading and being quiet, let Him talk to you. Being quiet and thinking of the positive, thinking of what God, you know, whatever thing is good, whatever thing is just, whatever thing, you know, that's what we need to put our minds on. And um, by developing a consistent devotional life. Like we have, I have my own personal devotional, Diane and I do a devotion, and then the way at night we, we, we do the, the family devotion, you know. And so we do our devotions and each different things. And, and so we have that time of devotion before God and thanking Him and praising Him and, and reading His Word every day. Every day. And um, 
by focusing on Bible promises and rejoicing in them. Because, Lord, I'm waiting for Christ to come back and take us home. I'm waiting for the rapture to come up and take us up. I'm waiting, you know, you know even if I, I, I die, you know, I'm just waiting to be in heaven. But God has other plans right now, so I'm serving Him. But I am always focusing on, on the Bible promises and rejoicing in them. That God said He'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's a promise. And when we're going through hard times, we know that God is right there. He hasn't left us. I love that, that poem about footprints in the sand. I mean, and it said the, the hard times is when, you know, when you saw one set of footprints, that's is when Jesus carried it. Yep. And how many times have we been carried? You know, through the, you know, grief and, and sorrow and, and things like that. And so, and also by attending church regularly so that the Bible teachings bring spiritual growth by being in Bible studies. By being at church, Sunday school, at church. But by digging in, you know, digging in yourself privately, but also digging in as a group. Sharing what you've known privately. I mean, it's an awesome thing when we have our Bible studies. We bounce things off of each other and stuff, and things that, you know, we might not even think of. And, 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 and a way to look at things. And so, um, we have a great time doing that. But this is how we are renewing your life. We're putting things on the positive and Everything on God, our minds on God. This world is falling apart. Yes. This world is, is, is uh, dying. Yes. And we are the light in the world of a dying world. And we are to shine that light for others who are dying can grasp hold yes. and come to Jesus. We are that light. Jesus tells us that we are the light of the world. We aren't to hide it. We aren't to push it under the bed or push it under the bushel. We are to shine it for everybody to see that we are His. That we are His. And the last thing I want to do, uh, the last point on is call to surrender your will. This is a big one. Your will. Your stubborn, pig-headed, rock-solid, hard heads will. To God. To God. And so, and it says here in verse 12, it says, Renew your minds that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, it's not our will, but it's God's will that we need to obey. We need to follow God's will for us. Will. Thalima. Thalima. What one wishes or has determined shall be done. Perfect carries the idea of being complete, of something being everything it should be. Our will should desire only what God desires and lead us to do only what He wants us to do in the way He wants us to do it, according to His will and by His power, not by our will. But our stubborn, sinful wills crave satisfaction in this world. Our stubborn wills crave satisfaction in this world. Yes. And when, when 1 John 2.15, John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the world of the Father, the love of the Father is not in him. All this stuff is passing away. Yeah, we get a new car. Yeah, oh boy, we're so excited about our new car, right? But after two or three years, what we start doing? Complaining. Huh? Complaining. Complaining why? Things are falling apart. And usually, once you get the thing paid off, that's when it starts to break down. And then you got people calling you up, saying about getting an extended warranty. How many of you got those calls? The extended warranty calls. And, and it's coming from all over the United States. You know, and, and so I bet you they're just scammers. I mean, how do you do an extended warranty on a car that's all warranty? And it's not through dealership warranty. You're just paying some other company to, you know, and it might be just a scam too. Um, but, you know, we're bent on pleasure. The lust of the flesh. You know, the, the three categories of sin. You know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of the mind. So we're bent on pleasure. 
the lust of flesh will please us. You know, men when they look at a woman, what do they look at? They don't look at the inner being of a woman. They look at the outer one, of a woman, right? The beauty. I mean, what her what her figure is. You know, her shape or whatever, her complexion, whatever. You know, and so it is the, the loss of the flesh. We're bent on pleasure. And, you know, and then our will is also bent on possessions, the lust of the eyes. I mean, you've never seen a blind man rob a store. Have you? Rob something in the store, steal something in the store? A blind man, you don't know what you grab. Unless he's feeling around and seeing what it is and stuff. You know, he might grab the wrong thing. <laughs> But the whole point is, we see the people, you know, why they steal things the desk, they see it. I mean, when I worked at Walmart and electronics, you wouldn't believe how many things we found unopened and everything, packages shoved behind things and everything else. People steal it, you know, and put it in their, their coats or, or whatever they have, and, and off they go, you know. Uh, one time there were people uh, over the fence out in the lawn and garden when they were hauling off TV sets, and they were hauling off via, via, uh, VC, well, back then VCRs. And things like that, they're putting over the fence. Somebody else is putting them in a the car, you know. And uh, but it is because of the lust of the eye. Then we're bent on self exaltation. Self exaltation. What is that? The pride of life. Being all puffed up. Look at me. Look at me. Why, why do you think women um, doll themselves up? Why does women put on all that makeup and rouge? So we don't scare anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know but you know they want people to look at them and say how you know, pretty they are and all this and that you know and or 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 you know you you work up the corporate ladder and it doesn't matter who you're going to stop to get there but you're going to get there you're going to be number one. See, that's the pride of life is to be exalted to brag people bragging about you people talking about you. You know, you get all puffed up, the pride of life. These are our wills because of our sinful nature. But we need to surrender our wills to God. We need to surrender our bodies, we need to surrender our minds, and we need to surrender our wills to Christ. And a lot of times we can't do that because of our stubbornness and our pigheadedness and, and our flesh. You know, we want what we want. And so uh, the world and its loss are passing away. Satisfaction comes when the will is surrendered to God. Our imperfect wills must always be subject, subject to His perfect will. Yes. When you surrender to Him, you can't go wrong. To give our lives to Him, a living sacrifice. This is the living sacrifice. What did Jesus say that we are to do? We are to love the Lord our God. With all of our what? With all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. And that's basically saying yourself, your whole being. We are to love the Lord our God. We are to surrender our be living sacrifices to Christ. We are to be living sacrifices. So how, in conclusion, how strong is your commitment Are you committed? Are you all in? Or are you just partway in? Or are you kind of tippy toeing in? Or are you all in? A living sacrifice to God. Are you willing to surrender all to Him? As we sing our last hymn, come on up and surrender to Christ. You know someone who is not saved.